these independent methods because each technique that I'll show you, lots of uncertainty, can be interpreted different ways. If they all point in the same direction, okay, we have some confidence. We still can be refuted. We have confidence. Okay, so let's think about Darcy's Law. Everybody knows Darcy's Law out there, I hope, uh, since you're all good hydrogeologists and hydrologists. In the unsaturated zone, we have to modify Darcy's Law just a bit uh, to account for the fact that the porous medium may not be saturated at all times. Okay, so we have our flux Q is proportional to the hydraulic conductivity, which is now a function of the capillary pressure or the moisture content, multiplied by a gradient, okay, a gradient in total potential. Now, the problem is in the unsaturated zone or in soils, measuring this hydraulic conductivity, which is a function of water content or pressure, is extremely difficult, particularly when we get to really dry soils, 5-10% water content. You also saw in those uh, slides I showed you of the unsaturated zone, it's real heterogeneous. So how do we pick a representative value of hydraulic conductivity? Okay, you tell me. So we can't really do the conductivity very well. We, we're getting better, but it's still a ways off. What we can measure quite well is the, the gradient in potential, the potential energy gradient in the, in the fluid phase. Okay, that's easy. So what I can do pretty well is tell you the direction of flow. I can't tell you too well its magnitude, but I can get a pretty good handle on the direction, which is controlled by the gradient. Okay? So let's just simplify Darcy's Law to really what's called Bar Buckingham Darcy Law. Uh, which is based from soil physics back in the turn of the century. If we assume primarily one-dimensional flow, Q in the Z direction on the left-hand side of this equation um, is equal to the product of the hydraulic conductivity, K of H, times then our potential energy terms, which we have two of. Okay? The first term in the brackets is the gradient in capillary pressure. Okay? Now, what's capillary pressure? Oftentimes, students have a hard time with this. Um, it's negative. Okay? Pressures are negative in the soil. How can things be negative? Capillary pressure, in, in kind of simple terms, just represents the decrease in potential energy that the water has when it's in the porous media, okay? Because of interactions between the liquid phase and the solid phase, okay? That water has lost some potential energy compared to water in a glass sitting next to it, okay? I can pour water into the soil very well. It's sucked in. But in order to get that water out of the soil, I have to apply some energy or do some work on that water. Okay, so it has a lower potential energy. That's why it's negative. And we write it in terms of pressure. Okay, we can also write it in terms of head if we wanted to, or ener energy per unit mass. All right, so that's the first term. The second term is just gravity, always acting, unity. And let's look at some data then. Okay, these are, uh, what you're seeing now are two plots. The plot on your left is the capillary pressure as measured from some of these core samples from a deep unsaturated zone. Each point represents a core sample. From the land surface, up near the top of the graph, down to the water table, which at Frenchman Flat is about 240 meters. Okay? So quite a distance. The bottom axis is the capillary pressure. And these were measured either on filter, using filter paper, equilibrium, or water activity meter. Both very simple techniques. If you're interested, I'll give you some contact information. Talk to me afterwards. I can give you the information. Um, what you can see in the plot on the left is that the capillary pressures are close to zero near the water table. In fact, they are zero at the water table. They should be. Okay? There shouldn't be any capillary pressure. The sediments were saturated. Okay? Now, as we move up from the water table, the capillary pressures remain pretty uniform, okay? not, not particularly negative, not really dry, until we get to about 50 meters. Okay? And from 50 meters up to the land surface, the capillary pressures become really negative, which means the soil is dry okay? or getting drier. In fact, near the land surface, it's incredibly dry. And yet, vegetation still hangs on, but up in this region, very close to the land surface, within 10 meters or so, it's dry soil, okay? Tremendously, water is held very tightly. Now, we can take these data, okay? This is the capillary pressure. We can calculate a gradient in capillary pressure, add that to our gravity gradient, and look at what is the direction of flow, okay? The hydraulic gradient. And that's the graph on the right-hand side. Again, the left-hand axis of that plot is depth, okay? Land surface is up here. Water table is down at 250 meters. And the bottom axis is uh, the measurement of the hydraulic gradient. Now, hydraulic gradient of zero means what? No flow, 
no vertical flow, okay? Right, zero gradient, Darcy's law says there's no flux. Um, in this case, the way I've drawn this, a positive gradient, okay, implies a downward flux, and a negative gradient implies an upward flux. Okay, it all depends on the sign conventions, doesn't matter. But what you see is on this plot is that from the water table up to about, oh, 50 meters, 60 meters below the land surface, the gradient is essentially zero. It's slightly positive, indicating that there's a maybe a very small amount of downward flux. And then from about 60 meters below land surface to the land surface, the flux is upward. Okay, the gradient is upward, therefore the flux must be upward. So what's going on here? We have a divergence of the flux at somewhere around 70 meters, 60 meters, you know, somewhere in that range. What's happening? The system is not at steady state, okay? The profile is still draining, draining at fairly slow rates, because again, the moisture contents are low, and also drying upward, okay? So it's still responding to some change that occurred, some infiltration event at some time ago. And we'll talk about when that occurred later on. But importantly here, we can't tell you how much water's moving, but I can tell you pretty well that water's moving upward near the land surface from this technique. Okay, and that's good with respect to waste disposal. Now, another technique we can use, which is not too often used in, in unsaturated or the Vado zone, is we can look at uh, thermal profiling. Look at temperature profiles in the unsaturated zone. Okay? Now, there's two kinds of heat transfer mechanisms that go on in, the unsat in a deep unsaturated zone. The first is a conductive heat transport, which is just the, uh, the energy being produced by radioactive decay deep in the crust being conducted upward through the grains, through the water phase, through the gas phase, to the land surface. Okay, so the Earth is continuously losing energy. That's easy. Convective heat transport, what's that? Well, convective heat transport is the amount of heat moved with the flowing phase or with the water. Okay? It is the, the additional, the advected, we call it convective heat transport port mechanism. Now, if we assume we're at steady state with respect to heat transport, which we probably are, because heat, heat transport uh, thermal equilibrium occurs fairly quickly, um, we can simply write down a heat balance equation for a deep unsaturated zone. We have the divergence of the temperature of the fluid, fl uh, excuse me, divergence of the thermal fluxes, QT, is equal to zero. Okay, and then just below it, I've written the two principal components of the, of the heat flux. Okay, K times the gradient in uh, temperature. This is the conductive heat transport. And the convective heat transport is the second term, which has in it things like the heat capacity of water, the fluid density, uh, the temperature. And then this term QW, which is the rate of water flux. Okay, it is the water flux. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. We have a, a heat flux which is controlled by the water flux. So here it is, just kind of in schematic as to what, what's going on. Um, in the top 10 to 20, maybe as much as 30 meters, we have some seasonal heat, trans uh, heat transport processes going on. The boundary conditions are changing diurnally, seasonally. So we're going to have temperature fluctuations. Once we get down below maybe 30 meters or so, 20 meters, pretty much things are at steady state, okay? Our boundary conditions kind of, the, they damp out. And we have our two heat, or heat transfer mechanisms, conduction, moving upward, and convection, in this case, if we have recharge, water moving down, carrying with it cool water, okay? Now, if we don't have any convection and just, conve just conduction, we're going to have a straight line, the geothermal gradient, okay? Linear distribution of temperature. However, if there's significant convective heat transport, if there's a lot of water moving through the unsaturated zone, it's going to perturb this linear profile. Okay, and how's it, it going to look? Turns out that the temperature is going to be an exponential in our water flux QW. Okay? And it turns out for downward flow, we're going to have graphs, that temperatures which come down like this. Okay? And this is a bottom axis is temperature here, and the left axis is depth. Okay, so let's look at some data and some analysis. First, let's look at some analyses. Okay, this graph just shows depth on the left axis, temperature on the bottom axis, and I've just solved that, that partial differential equation for reasonable boundary conditions. I've used reasonable uh, thermal property information and water content information from the deep Vado zone, and in this case, Frenchman flat. And then I've just predicted what should the temperatures look like if I have certain magnitudes of recharge. 
okay? And the first one is this kind of red bowed line that you see down here. This is the predicted temperature distribution for a recharge rate of 100 millimeters a year, or about two-thirds of the annual precipitation. Okay, and you can see that it's significantly perturbed from linear. Okay, it's basically bowed uh, convex upward. Now, as we decrease the, the recharge rate, let's say we only have 10 millimeters per year of recharge, you can see now that the temperature profile with depth is, pre depth is pretty linear. Okay, there's not a lot of convective heat transport. And we go down to one millimeter per year, and essentially we have the conductive case, linear. Okay? So this technique is pretty good at estimating recharge rates if they're high enough. If they're fairly low, we really can't see it, can't resolve it. Now the orange triangles you see on this plot are actually measured temperatures in, a, in a, one borehole at Frenchman Flat. The borehole was completed. We took core samples out. Then uh, thermistors were buried were put down, back down in this borehole all the way to the water table, and then the whole thing was backfilled and let sit, and then we measured temperatures. Okay, and you can see that the temperatures are pretty linear. Okay, they fall along that linear profile, which would indicate that the rate of downward flux or upward flux is pretty small. Okay, probably less than about 10 or 20 millimeters per year. Otherwise, we'd see some of that, that uh, this convex behavior, which we don't. So thermal profiling, it's a neat technique, uh, but it's not very sensitive when the rates of recharge get pretty small. The best we can say from this technique is the rate of recharge is probably less than 10 millimeters a year. That's about all we can get from it. Okay, third technique, and again, independent. Let's look at a tracer, okay, in this case, chloride. Okay, chloride is a, is a very interesting, useful tracer in a lot of hydrologic studies. Okay, chloride salts are highly soluble. Um, they don't tend to sorb particularly too much, particularly at, uh, at higher pHs. So they're a fairly good conservative tracer. Chloride's not uptaken by plants very much. That's nice, makes it more conservative. Um, well, what about dissolution or production of chloride in the unsaturated zone or the saturated zone? There's not a lot of chloride-bearing minerals, but if there are, we can look at uh, bromide to chloride ratios in the soil water or the groundwater and see um, do they look like rainfall or seawater. Where's most of the chloride come from that we measure in groundwater or in the unsaturated zone? It comes from the rain. Okay? Um, if you're close to the coast, the rainfall concentration can be a few milligrams per liter. As you move inland, it's less. Um, we also have a significant input of chloride as dry deposition, okay? continuous rain of chloride on the land surface, which gets washed into the soil. The more humid environments, the less important that dry deposition is. The site we're working in, it's about probably 60% wet deposition and about 30, 40% dry deposition. That's a good tracer. Now, the simplest technique that's been around for dog's age to use chloride, something called the chloride mass balance technique to estimate recharge in the unsaturated zone. And it's real simple and it's very clever, okay? What happens on the left-hand side of this plot, we have a kind of a, a, a block of soil, okay, which we have some vegetation in. On the land surface, we apply chloride from rainfall and dry deposition. As the, the water and solutes move through the root zone, some of the water is uptaken by the vegetation, some percentage of it, not all of it. The chloride tends to stay behind in the liquid phase, okay, and so it moves down through the root zone, and then coming out of the root zone, water heading toward the water table, our recharge, it's carrying with it the salt, okay, which is going to be higher, or chloride, which will be higher in concentration than what was applied at the land surface, okay, because of evapoconcentration. So what we should see then, if we measured chloride concentration in soil water through the root zone and down into the unsaturated zone down below, we should see something that looks like on the right-hand side of this plot, okay, we have depth Z, and concentration of chloride in the soil water. Near the surface, low concentrations. As we move through the root zone, again, water is uptaken by the vegetation, concentrations go up, and then once we get out of the root zone, there's no more mechanisms to remove water or salt or chloride, so our concentrations remain constant down here. But again, there's downward motion of water. And we just use this balance of input to output to calculate a recharge rate. Okay, we have an input of chloride, which is the rainfall, its concentration, dry deposition, 
has to equal the amount of chloride leaving the root zone, which is the reach, recharge rate, times the concentration in the soil. Okay? Very simple. And so all we have to do is measure how much is coming in, concentration in the soil water, which is easy, of chloride, and then we just turn this equation around and estimate a recharge rate. It's been widely used very successfully and particularly works well as the rate of recharge decreases. Okay, we have more enrichment. Now, unfortunately, our data don't look anything like that. Here I have plotted chloride concentrations from two, the two sites, Frenchman Flat in the south, Yucca Flat in the north, and this is chloride concentration in the pore waters uh, as a function of depth, okay, depth on the left-hand axis. And I've just cut off the Yucca Flat profile to 250 meters. It actually goes down to 450 meters, but it looks the same. What do we see? Well, near the land surface, in both plots, we have very low concentrations of chloride. That's good. They reach a maximum just beneath the root zone, very high concentrations, about uh, half seawater salinity. But then instead of staying there at those high concentrations all the way to the water table, concentrations come down. In fact, we have this peak. And then in Frenchman Flat, we have this interesting little secondary bulge, and then low concentrations all the way down. Okay, so we have all the chloride is stored up near the surface, the top 50 meters. Yucca Flat's similar, but a bit different. Um, it has real high concentrations near the, beneath the root zone, and then low all the way down. Okay, so we don't see that second bump of chloride, and much less chloride stored there. So this should be kind of a hint to you that something's going on. The system's not at steady state. We can't use the chloride mass balance to calculate a recharge rate because we have some archives left over. These very low concentrations deep in the unsaturated zone would imply that at some time in the past, there was significant amount of recharge. There's very little enrichment of chloride in the water at depth in the unsaturated zone. So we might have had much higher rates of recharge and then a decrease in recharge through these, this time. Okay, but what we can say is, is that because of the high chloride concentrations near the land surface, directly beneath the root zone, we don't see a lot of evidence for macropore flow here, um, or preferential flow, is that the current recharge rate is very low. Okay, we're accumulating lots of chloride and the rates of recharge are quite small. I can't quantify how small, but very small. I meant to mention as we went through this, preferential versus piston flow, chloride methods are not very sensitive to estimating are we seeing piston flow or preferential flow. However, the thermal methods are really pretty good at it because we reach thermal equilibrium quickly. So we'd expect to be able to pick up preferential flow in temperatures. And then the water potential methods, looking at, at capillary pressures, those are very sensitive to slight changes in water content. So if we'd intersected some areas of, of fast flow, we would have seen it. And we didn't. All right, so let's summarize then. Modern recharge. Thermal profiles say that the recharge rates are at least less than 10 millimeters a year. It's the best we can do. The Darcy's Law hydraulic gradient approach says that the fluxes are actually upward from, say, 50 meters or so. So water flux is moving upward. And the chloride concentrations, very high near the land surface, which would imply very little water moving past the root zone. However, at some time in the past, there was significant recharge, okay, based on those very low chloride concentrations. Now, we can summarize then. It says the current climate, coupled with vegetation, because all these sites had vegetation, reduces the net infiltration to effectively zero in these nice alluvial deep soil profiles. Okay, now the DOE was quite happy about this. This is good. Low rates of recharge for a waste site are very important. Okay, you don't want the stuff moving downward significantly. But this analysis is based on the fact that there's vegetation. Okay, and the vegetation, as we're going to see later, is critical to maintaining water balances in arid regions. So yes, there's very little recharge today in undisturbed settings, but you saw what the disturbed settings look like uh, with boxes and buried junk. Um, whether we can make that claim all the way to those sites is, is we don't. Okay, let me take a step back. Now, let's move on then to paleoclimate, paleo recharge. What happened in the past? Can we use these unsaturated zones as archives of paleoclimate? And I think we can to some degree. Um, on the right-hand side, I've just got a little plot here of 
of uh, water moving down through a deep unsaturated zone and a couple of pulses of water, one 10,000 years old, another 20,000 years old. So just kind of moving vertically downward through to, toward the water table. Now, why should we preserve these paleoclimate signatures, preserve water chemistries or anything like that? Well, remember, we have fairly low moisture contents. I didn't show you data, but oh, the water contents are on the order of about 10% by volume. So there's a low water contents, which are going to limit diffusion. And then we have fairly low velocities, which are going to limit dispersion. Okay, so we may actually end up with uh, fairly, fairly discrete packs of, of water moving through the unsaturated zone. Not a lot of mixing. I kind of view it a bit like a Lagrangian ice core, the ice cores that have come out from Greenland and Antarctica, which preserve the, the climate and, uh, and chemistries of snow. This is one in which the water is moving down through the medium. So it's a Lagrangian type. Now the hypothesis we're going to have that we're going to suggest is, is that these Vado zones act as low pass filters. That is, they allow the big climate changes to come through. But the high frequency ones, the, the ones we see even today, may not be transmitted through the root zone. Okay, so we're looking for the big climate signals in the unsaturated zone. Now, why would we worry about paleoclimate? You know, what has, have things changed? Well, the Great Basin has seen tremendous changes in, uh, in climate. This is a shot looking uh, down toward Frenchman Flat. The waste site is down here, actually. You can see the modern vegetation is just what you would expect for a desert, lots of cactuses and very sparse vegetation, lots of bare ground. But 16,000 years ago, the environment of the Great Basin looked dramatically different. Okay? In the northern part of the Great Basin, around Reno and around Salt Lake City, or modern of those two cities, huge glacial lakes, Lake Lahontan in the west, uh, Lake Bonneville in the east, Tremendously cha tremendous changes in the, in the hydrologic budget in the Great Basin. We had much more either precipitation or less more clouds or a variety of factors can all come to play, but we produced these lakes. Uh, we clearly had much higher effective moistures floating around the landscape, which is going to change how much recharge occurs. Now, in southern Nevada, we don't see evidence of these, these lakes, uh, th at least through the last glacial period, but we definitely know that the climate was wetter. Okay, we do have lots of proxy information that shows us that significantly higher rates of rainfall and cooler temperatures in the southern Great Basin. All of those are going to affect recharge. Let's see if we can see it in the Vado zone. Now, before we do that, a real quick review of uh, paleoclimate over the last, say, 150,000 years. So you have a clue. So we're all on the same page. Okay, right now we're in an interglacial. Okay, we're warm dry conditions. This plot shows uh, a, a proxy for, say, precipitation. Temperature on the left axis, time on the bottom axis, with the right-hand end of the axis of the bottom axis being the present. Okay, so let's, let's actually start 150,000 years ago. So we'll start at the left-hand axis of this plot. Where were we? Well, we're in the midst of glacial climate. Okay, we've been in these glacial cycles, glacial interglacial cycles, for on the order of a million years. Temperatures were cool, okay? We came out of that at what's called termination two on the order of 123,000 years ago, something like that. Um, and we've marched very quickly into an interglacial climate. Higher temperatures, warmer conditions. Fluctuations through that, we don't really know in great detail how that inter last interglacial looked. People are working on it. We came out of the last interglacial around 120, 115,000 years ago actually fairly abruptly, and then kind of smoothly, the temperatures declined, okay? As we came toward what's called the last glacial maximum, termination one, uh, which is the one we think about, the last time the ice sheets moved across North America. Minimum temperatures, maximum rainfall, or certainly minimum temperatures, minimum trans evaporation. And then we came out of that fairly quickly into the current interglacial or the, cur or the Holocene, we bounced around through a few period of, of sort of shifts in climate. Now we're kind of in our current climate. So we see these, these, these areas or these time periods at the end of the glacial periods of coolest temperatures, most likely time for recharge. Okay? Now I've also I've filtered this out. There's a whole bunch of high frequency bumps on this, on this plot, several decades kind of time scales of climate changes, which um, uh, I've just filtered out just to keep it fairly, fairly straightforward. 
But we don't expect that Beto zones would respond to those, at least not ones that are in real arid environments. We're going to look for these time periods. Okay? We do know from, from uh, proxy records that, again, it was quite wet and moist at the end of the last glacial, here at about 16, 12 to 16,000 years ago. But we do have an idea from a couple of records that this last end of glaciation, about 120,000 years ago, was even wetter. Okay? Lakes were at higher stands. Uh, um, cave deposits looked like there was more water moving around the landscape. Okay, so those are important periods. Now, how are we going to, how we do, oh, we're doing well for time. Okay, hang in there. We're getting close. Okay, how are we going to use these Vado zones as archives? Well, the easiest thing to do or to use is chloride again. Okay, again, chloride's a nice conservative tracer. We can estimate the soil water age as a function of chloride. Okay, and it's real pretty, it's quite easy. Chloride's accumulated. On the left hand side of this graph, we have depth Z on the left axis, chloride concentration on the right axis, and I've just shown you kind of a sketch of what our profiles look like. Okay, they have this bulge here below the root zone, and then they come down to low concentrations at depth. Okay? Now, it's pretty easy to estimate if the water and the chloride are moving together, how old is water, say, at this depth Z? Well, the age of that water, if chloride and water are moving together in a piston flow kind of behavior, is simply the time needed to accumulate all the chloride above it. Okay, so if we know the chloride accumulation rate every year, we can calculate the age of the water at any depth Z. And that's just what this equation here is up in the right-hand corner is the age of water at any, depth, at any depth Z is the integral, the total amount of chloride stored above that depth, divided by the annual accumulation rate. Okay, that's which, that, the amount of chloride which falls as rainfall and dry deposition. Okay, so pretty simple. So we'd end up with then plots that have depth versus age, and the age would get older as we got further down in the unsaturated zone. Now, just to remind you, here's what our chloride profiles look like. Okay, we had high chloride near just below the root zone, then lower, and then very low concentrations in both boreholes at depth. Okay, so we just run through those calculations, uh, assuming a chloride input rate that's a little bit higher than the modern uh, the modern rate. And at Frenchman Flat, we have uh, by the time we get to about 60 meters below the land surface. Our soil water ages are about 120,000 years old. Okay, it took 120,000 years to accumulate the chloride that we see above that depth. It's pretty old. French uh, Yucca Flat, same kind of shape, uh, but unfortunately, by the time we get to the bottom of the borehole, um, rather than 120,000 years, we see about 20 to 30,000 years of chloride accumulation. Okay, so the age of the water right above the water table is maybe 20 or 30,000 years old. Very different ages, similar shapes. Now, do you believe this? Okay? Do you believe that I know that I have 120,000-year-old water in the unsaturated zone? Okay? Well, if you do, that's good, but sometimes I don't believe it, um, particularly after giving this lecture about 40 times. Why? What don't we know? We know how much chloride's there. Easy, easy to measure. But we don't know what the chloride flux rates are. We certainly don't know what it is, what it was, and we barely know what it is today. Okay? Um, today, it's fairly well constrained. Okay? At about 75 milligrams per meter squared per year. About two-thirds of that comes in rainfall. A third of that comes in dry deposition. Now, and that's also confirmed by looking at chlorine 36 to chloride ratios in rainfall. Okay, we get a similar magnitude of chloride flux. But what about in the past? Okay, I don't know. I wasn't out there collecting rainfall samples. Um, we do know that there was higher rates of rainfall. Okay, that's fairly well documented. It was a more pluvial environment. We can kind of take that into account. We can perhaps, in fact, we've done that. We've added about another 40 or 50 percent to the annual rainfall, okay, back pre-end uh, pre, uh, of the last glacial period. But what about you know, all these lakes drying up. 